righty. Give us a little countdown. Two, one. Actually, you know, the first thing I really wanted to say to you was um, I wanted to send my condolences because Serbia crashed out of the World Cup pretty uh, pretty early on. I actually had them at least making the quarterfinals. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they were one of the biggest disappointments at the tournament. I don't know if, if you've been watching it at all, but. I have. I woke up at 4 a.m. to watch the Cameroon game, which was which was a very good game, but uh, yeah. Score. Um, yeah, no, after Serbia crashed out, then I switched to Croatia because uh, <laughs> I'm from there and they done pretty well. Uh, and then I switched to France because my sister lives in Paris uh, mm. and done really well, but lost the game. So, but you know, I, so. I, I feel that I, uh, many, all of my teams basically crashed out pretty early, obviously, with the United States crashing out of the round of 16. Germany got grouped, quite unfortunate there. England. Didn't they get to the quarter, you know, they like knocked out by France. So, um, you know, all my teams were knocked out, but I guess it's at the end, Messi did win it. So that's really cool. It's really capping off his career. So what more can you really ask for? Yeah. And that's final games. That was the way it's yeah. the game to be played. This was just incredible. And by the end of it, there's just like there's so many goals and so much excitement that you kind of like, so drained. You can't even be upset if your team lost. Yeah. You know, I guess it's okay. <laughs> were you were you at home or were you like were you out somewhere watching it? No, I was at home. Yeah. Uh, so I was with my kids, and so I was like, yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I, we were. Uh, I was out um, at a friend's house, and man, like that World Cup final, it might have easily the best World Cup final. Might have been the greatest like football match I've ever seen. It might have been the greatest like sports match I've ever seen in my entire life. No, I have an obvious bias to soccer, but like, yeah. it was that good. No, especially since some of these games are just like you know, pretty boring because the stakes are so high. So, but it's really cautious. Mm -hmm. so like a couple of world finals ago, I think when when Italy and France played, this was just like yeah, two thousand six. Boring. Yeah, and this was this was not boring. Well, the best the best moment of that World Cup was when Zidane headbutt the Italian defender. He got red carded. That was like the moment of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is like, you know, not actually soccer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, today, uh, really excited to have on Professor Ognen Miljanic. Did I pronounce that correctly? Ognen sure. Miljanic. Um, Yugoslavian born and uh, university professor here at University of Houston. So, how are you doing, Professor Miljanic? Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Mm. Yeah, um, I guess we'll start. Um, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, talk about your uh, your background, um, and hopefully the the audience can engage with that a little bit. Yeah. So I, you know, I was uh, as you mentioned, I was born in Yugoslavia, uh, which is a country that that is no more uh, uh, in the in the late seventies. Uh, and you know, the, my my parents uh, met in college, uh, and uh, you know, I was growing up in Belgrade, which is uh, you know, it's a big city. Even then, back then, it was a big city, but uh, it was sort of very, kind of very sheltered upbringing. It was sort of, we would really, uh, it's going to sound a little, well, sort of romanticized, but we would just go out and play between these apartment buildings for a whole day during the summer and just kind of find a way home back, uh, back in the evening or when we get mm -hmm. hungry. Um, uh, and uh, and that's where I, you know, then when did all my schooling, uh, I, I went to college there in the University of Belgrade. Uh, side of chemistry um and then in the year 2000 at the very end of 2000 i moved to california to study um uh, at, to do my phd at uh, berkeley uh and uh and this was you know uh, this year i guess sort of mark, marked half of my life being in the united states uh so i spent after 2000 i spent the next eight years in california doing a phd and a postdoc and then came to to uh to texas to take up what was my first real job uh, yeah. in 2008. <laughs> That's where we met. Yeah, one day at a time. Um, yeah, I definitely we were we were we were discussing a little bit beforehand because um, we were mentioning we were talking about Yugoslavia, and I definitely wanted to ask you a few questions about that because, um, I mean, the fall of World War II, and that is it. The what's right there? The Mediterranean? No, the Baltic Sea. What's the sea that's right there? Oh man, it's the Adriatic Sea. Which Adriatic is the Sea. It's kind of like a really big bay of the of the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of Mediterranean culture in the coastal places, but then it kind of 
drops off very quickly as you go inland. And so it's replaced by, you know, Austrian and Hungarian and Turkish influences, as well as in a lot of Slavic culture, of course. Mm-hmm. In general, though, at least at least from the at least from my perspective in growing up in the United States, you don't really learn about the Yugoslavian history and like the Adriatic Sea, like the whole, you know, Croatia, Serbia, Kosovo, um, Hungary, that area. Like it's not really taught that well. So I, I wanted to ask you, I know I kind of wanted to ask you about the, you know, growing up in Yugoslav, then Yugoslavia. Um, now it's like six different countries, but what it was like growing up in that area in that time, because from my brief look into that history, it was a, a communist regime. I'm not really exactly sure of the fall of World War II, so I don't know if you want to. Uh, so, um, well, first, if it makes you feel any better, when we studied history in, in Yugoslavia, the, the whole U.S. history was was one week, right? So <laughs> the enough. war independence, civil war, sec- Pearl Harbor, everything, all that was just two class <laughs> periods. And of all the U.S. writers, we only studied studied for some reason Mark Twain and, and Faulkner. So okay. <laughs> you know, there are losses of all sides. Uh, but, you know, Yugoslavia is sort of an interesting country. It was sort of um, uh, constructed after the two big empires uh, lost the the First World War, the, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which completely mm-hmm. sort of disappeared, and the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which really was really severely cut down to push sides after that. And then mm-hmm. from really the, the the Serbia which was in Montenegro which were independent countries at the time but very small um, and the remnants of Austro-Hungarian Empire the southern parts of it and Turkey this this country was was put together and um, and it was you know done at an international agreement in, in Paris uh, and the country was sort of different from most European countries in that it was by design sort of multi-ethnic you know, most of the European countries were sort of Nation, nation states hmm. with one dominant culture, one dominant nationality, ethnicity, uh, and this one wasn't. And they had um, uh, at least three dominant uh, ethnicities, which were Serbians, Croatians, and and, and Slovenians, but many others. Um, and that was, um, you know, going along pretty well. Uh, the the country after the Second World War or during the Second World War sort of switched from monarchy. To, uh, to a communist regime. Uh, but then very quickly, uh, you, shortly after the Second World War, it, uh, it very quickly distanced itself from the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of this soft socialism uh, that uh, really most of the things that you hear about Soviet Union completely do not apply to former Yugoslavia. So mm-hmm. they were, it was, you know, people could travel easily, they could travel to the West, uh, Western tourists and, and you know, my dad studied in the United States mm-hmm. and Soviet Union, so this was sort of open to all sides, uh, and it had very strong relationships with countries that intentionally refused to be part of either the eastern, either the Eastern Bloc or the Western Bloc. And so, um, so uh, former Yugoslavia had a very strong relationship with a lot of African countries, mm-hmm. uh, with India, Egypt, uh, sort of places that really didn't want to pick sides in the Cold War. Um, and so that was sort of uh, something that you know I sort of experienced during my uh, my uh, uh, childhood and and, and, and adulthood. Uh, where and it's 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 quite an interesting relation to to the United States. That you know, um, we all, University of Belgrade always had a lot of African students studying, mm. uh, but they mm. were almost always really wealthy Africans. Yeah, that their parents had, you know, money to send over to to Europe to study, and so it was just kind of, um, uh, it was it's sort of a, a pretty unusual, but not very foreign, uh, you know, compared to, to the United States at the time. Sure. Um, but then you know during the nineties, which was really sort of my coming of age. I mean, I was born in nineteen seventy eight, so in the early nineties, I had you know, just, you know, teenager. Quite a time. Um, uh, yeah, so this country you know, started falling apart, um, and uh, this. And by was... country, you mean you, Yugoslavia, right? Like that entire Yugoslavia, yes. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think the, the uh, it's not really clear why, but uh, this sort of tensions between the uh, between the these different ethnicities, different religions, and you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of point of differences. But I think uh, the elites in these. Uh, Back then, it was there were provinces of, of Yugoslavia. Now they're independent countries. Mm. So the elite started sort of 
emphasizing this and seeking you know justification for their own problems in the in their neighbors right uh, and so this eventually uh was uh you know was was pretty tragic because Three, at least three wars, three small wars, but small wars by 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 you know world standards, but you know pretty big by the standards of people living there. Um, mm. Came out of this first in uh, uh, in Croatia, then in Bosnia, and then eventually in Kosovo in 1999. Uh, mm. And as the result, the country fell apart into six independent countries. Actually, depending on who you ask, uh, it's seven, right? Because uh, the last uh, the last uh, the composition was Serbia's uh, province of Kosovo breaking off into independent country, mm. which is recognized by, of course, it's not recognized by Serbia, but it is recognized by uh, by many countries in the world, including the United States. Um, and so oh. that ends up being uh, breaking a country, which, you know, to sort of give you a sense of scale, this was maybe 25 million people, the former Yugoslavia. Um, mm. And now, you know, the largest country of these now is Serbia with, with seven, seven and a half million people. Wow. Now, what what were like? Do you know like what were the the tensions that wanted to the, get these independent countries? Like, was it ethnicity? Was there religious differences? Like, do you know that like like why people are just hung, power hungry and just wanted their own country? Uh, well, you know, I I wish I had an answer to that, but uh, you know what I think is that a lot of um, you know these countries they had differences, of course, uh, and. Uh, one of the main differences was religion, right? So the mm. Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro, they're sort of Greek Orthodox. Slovenia and Croatia are dominantly Catholic, and Bosnia is mixed between mm. these two religions as well as Islam. Uh, and Kosovo is almost entirely Muslim. Um, and so this is sort of a tempting explanation, except that people in that part of the world are really not very religious, right? So because, you know, the sort of uh, decades of, of socialism sort of Kind of suppress these religious sentiments um, and so you know i uh, and you know most of my friends from elementary school have you know visited churches or mosques only as tourists not really yeah to, <laughs> to, to worship there um and so that's you know that's kind of seems like a tempting explanation but i don't think it's it's really true i think one of the you know like a lot of these wars and this is a strong economic background um, that uh, you know, this country which uh, was um, was put together was very unevenly developed. Right. Mm. So, on the very north was Slovenia, which um, I think is uh, is now part of the European Union. And if you go to Slovenia, it would be very difficult to distinguish it from Switzerland. Mm. Right. So it's just a very wealthy country. Uh, yeah. You know, very strong. Where that it can just you know, it was always wealthy, right? And on the very south, you know, are places like Montenegro and and uh, Kosovo and Macedonia, which are just very poor in comparison. Um, mm. And then in the middle are sort of Serbia and Croatia, which are uh, you know between these two extremes, uh, but they're the biggest in size and they're used to be the biggest in influence. And so what. Um, uh, what I think was was happening while these all these nations lived together is that the wealthier ones were were sponsoring the the poorer ones, uh, but all the decisions were made not proportional to this but proportional to the population. And so a lot of decisions were coming from Serbia uh, that were influencing everybody. Uh, and uh, most of the time these decisions were pretty reasonable. But at some point when sort of Serbia, especially with relation to Kosovo, started sort of suppressing human rights of, of ethnic Albanians that lived there. Mm. Uh, then, you know, Slovenia was the first one to sort of say, well, we're not going to be part of this. We're not going to pay for this. Uh, and uh, and we're just going to leave. Uh, and that uh, then sort of started this domino reaction. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm um, always interested um, with world history whenever I can get it. Now, Something I also wanted to ask you about that is so growing up in then Yugoslavia, but I guess I'll just you know I, I'll just say, I'll just say Serbia now. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, what were some of the you know what were some of the biggest cultural differences you know uh, growing up in Serbia and being here and being in the United States now, or I should say really you know California and Houston because you know America is pretty big. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, and also cultural difference, but also like education wise. So you know you did you know primary school and you. And basically, bachelor's degree at Belgrade, but then switching to a uh, graduate school here. Like, what were some of the major differences that you saw? 
Well, one of the big differences in terms of society is that, you know, growing up in a, in a socialist country, all of these economic differences, they're sort of very flattened out. So, mm. um, so you, of course, you had, you know, wealthy people and poor people, mm. but the differential between them was nowhere, you know, it was many, many times smaller than the United States, right? And so sort of the whole concept of working two jobs to support your family was completely foreign. And it's still, I think, pretty foreign uh, in, in Serbia. Um, but back during when I was a you know, kid, you know, you could have a very, very humble job, be a janitor, and you could have a family with three kids and, um, and, uh, and you could support that family. Uh, yeah. the, the reason for that is that a lot of things... Uh, were either heavily subsidized or completely subsidized by the state. Mm. Uh, this included uh, daycare. Um, of course, um, you know we care about it in the US a lot. Uh, healthcare, all forms of education, university education, um, and and many other things. Um, and so, um, so then there was really no. Uh, there was, of course, some, but pretty small economic obstacles uh, to just advancing yourself as much as you you wanted and, and were capable of. And so my my dad's uh, come from from Montenegro, and his parents were, you know, they were they had you know pretty pretty low paying jobs. And mm -hmm. his, my grandfather was a, was a locksmith, and my my grandmother worked in a tobacco factory. Um, and so they couldn't really send a child to to college if they had to pay for it. Um, Where was your mom, and, Where's your grandmother from again? Montenegro. So Montenegro. The, Do they the have the, they have the, they got the soil for uh, tobacco there. I'm so. That's actually uh, no, I don't think so. I think a lot of this tobacco was grown across the border in in what was that what is now Bosnia, but back then it was the same country. Oh, okay, uh, and okay. it was uh, it was then processed there or something. I see. Okay, I am pretty vague on the details myself. <laughs> uh, and um, anyway, so my dad, you know, he went to to college, and they they uh, support. So of course, the the tuition was was free, uh, and. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, then eventually he got fellowships and supported himself through that. So he eventually became a college professor. Mm. Um, but uh, from from very humble, economically very humble beginnings. And I think this is something that, you know, in the U.S. is in theory possible, but I think it's less and less common and uh, and happens to fewer and fewer people. Yeah. Definitely um, is a, lot of, a lot of people here in the United States compared to the, the population size, you know. Yeah, so this sort of, uh, it was really sort of easy to um, uh, to at least, you know, have education and and healthcare it was yeah. relatively even uh, whoever you were, right? Mm. Um, and so that was a big difference. Uh, now, of course, it wasn't all, you know, land of, of, of milk and honey. Um, so, uh, you know, when it came to the United States, sort of the the open-mindedness uh, of people just was, was very impressive. And I, you know, in the beginning, I didn't, I wasn't very culturally shocked, but sort of in retrospect, I was just like, well, this is very different. Now we have mm. to, um, to uh, consider that I came to, to one of the most open-minded places in the U S of Berkeley, California, Yeah, uh, which is pretty. Uh, so, you know, when I first came to the U S I thought like the rest of the U S are just like this, and <laughs> not, not, not quite. Um, but I think, you know, that that applies, you know, throughout the United States that, you know, the, the U.S. has a lot of internal divisions and a lot of, you know, issues with other countries in the world. And, and uh, but throughout that, you know, I think uh, just on a very individual level, I, I find that an average American is a lot more open minded about things that an average, uh, really, I would generalize this to an average European, but especially mm. an average you know, citizen of Serbia at the time when I was growing up. Mm. So how so how did you get into you know University of Belgrade? Um, I don't know. Is that like I, I assume that's the because how well, how big is Belgrade? Like how big is the the city population? Belgrade, you know, so Serbia and Belgrade are sort of very uh, very uneven. Belgrade is like, nowadays it's probably two million people. Okay, uh, and all Serbia is seven seven and a half. So it's you know really mm. about almost a third of a country of the country. Yeah. And then not only that, but it's very much a centralized country right so in the u.s of course you know like uh, this is capital dc but you know a lot of stuff a lot of important stuff happens there and it's very much not centered in dc in serbia almost everything that uh that almost everything that is happening is the epicenter of that is Belgrade. Mm. Uh, and especially when it comes to anything that has uh, to do with government administration 
education and so on. And so the University of Belgrade is by far the biggest and I would like to say the best university in, in Serbia. Um, uh, and it's it's very large. I think, uh, I don't know the exact numbers now, but I think at the time when I was studying there, it was 50,000 students. That's, um, a, yeah, that's, a, that's a sizable university then. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, and so the, the way you would, um, uh, also our high schools were sort of structural, dif- structured differently uh, mm. because they would you would typically have uh, two tracks of high schools. One were the so-called gymnasiums, uh, which are sort of very German concept, uh, where which are high schools that are kind of giving you broad education that is really not good for very much except getting you into college. Mm. Right? Um, and uh, and then the other high schools were sort of uh, more vocational high schools, uh, and uh, these were really for I like to call it for the kids that really know knew what they wanted to do, right? And so there was. Uh, uh, you know, a very uh, this this high school is very difficult to get into, but it was for electrical engineering. Right? So if you wanted to be a, a, a programmer, or you know, just wanted to work in a power plant, uh, you yeah. would go to that high school, and you could still go to college. But of course, your choices would be uh, would be a bit more limited because you couldn't just you know go to this high school and study you know French after that. Yeah, that would be a little, a little unusual. Um, and so, um, and so then after you know after high school, you you apply to uh, you would apply to an individual major. So you the, the, there were there were no majors within university. You start you have to figure out what you want to do right after high school. Mm-hmm. You apply to study that, uh, and then um, depending on your uh, entrance exam, on your uh, high school scores, and on how competitive it is, you get in or you don't get in. Um, and um, uh, studying chemistry was not very competitive, so I easily got in. <laughs> and then, but you know, the, you know, my my friends that that wanted to study things that are a lot more uh, competitive, such as law or pharmacy, mm. uh, some of them ended up studying chemistry because that was a second choice. And so, if you can't study pharmacy, then. Um, but that was sort of the thing that was, you know, in retrospect, quite uh, actually quite difficult that you have to, at the age of eighteen, without really having, you know, done anything. You have to sort of decide what you're going to dedicate yourself, uh, and then you know it's if you think that you made a wrong decision, then there's not no such thing as switching majors. You basically start over, yeah. Right? Uh, unless you're switching to something very similar, where they could you know take some of your courses, but otherwise, uh, it was, yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems true in many parts of the world where yeah, <laughs> college or bust basically feels that in, in America. I think the tides kind of change a little bit. I know a lot of my friends are going to like um vocational schools to like do um like trade jobs or trade school but yeah i mean to have everything figured out at 18 i mean just <laughs> um yeah and i think you know i think it's sort of uh i think having these trade schools is, is actually a great thing but if you mm-hmm. um if you don't know what you want to do with yourself which i think is a pretty common theme if you're, teenager, if you're 18 <laughs> uh and um and it certainly was a theme for me. Then, uh, then I think you know, getting some time for independent exploration mm. is good. And I think U.S. system does that pretty well because um, uh, most of students here live outside of their homes once mm. they're in college. And yep. then for the first time, they really kind of really. Of course, they're not completely independent, depending on who pays the bills. But you know, they kind of can make decisions with some pretty significant independence. And I yeah. think. You know, making these life decisions uh, really is important that you have that independence. Um, yeah. And so, yes, I definitely then, you know, agree. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just agreeing. So I think uh, at the same time, you know, once you uh, once you sort of get into a track and then uh, and then start doing it, and then uh, year after year after year, then you sort of find um, uh, find interests and find purpose in that. Um, regardless of what your choices might have been, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago. Sure. And now was the university of I assume that that's, was it more of a vocational school, not a gymnasium, right? So it was more of a specialized school at Belgrade. University of Belgrade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, uh, then you, you, it was sort of, uh, because you, you select your major right away and then you do Mm -hmm. four years of that. Then at the end of that, you're really very much an expert in in whatever you're chosen. And so I think, at the time when you finish the the U.S. chemistry major and, and a Serbian chemistry major, I would say that the Serbian one would suddenly have more uh, more uh, more 
chemistry classes under their belt. Uh, mm. In terms of research, um, research experience and research knowledge, um, that has to be sort of corrected for the fact that the labs are in, are in a pretty poor shape in most of Serbia. So yeah. Uh, but in terms of you know just how many chemistry classes have you taken by the time a graduate, uh, it's it's a lot more there. Yeah. Now, did you know since birth if you wanted to do chemistry, or did you like kind of grow into that? When did that start to transpire? <laughs> no, not not since so not since birth. But uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, my parents studied the physical chemistry, right? So there was some mm-hmm. influence, but although they they were very cautious not to not really push me in that direction. But I, um, you know, I started doing really studying this in in middle school. I was, I was sort of getting interested in that, and we had our first chemistry classes, and uh, uh, but it was by far not my only interest. Mm-hmm. So I was. Uh, I was also interested in in linguistics and and, and just writing uh, a lot uh, and uh, and math uh, and uh, and computers right uh, which you know nowadays like seems uh, seems customary Maybe but you, you know you, like you get a lot of that with chemistry you you know you got to write papers you got to you know analyze you got to model things you know <laughs> that's uh, that is a different kind of kind of writing though <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I was at the end of high school, I was really torn between these three things, sort of studying writing, chemistry and uh, and electrical engineering or sort of programming. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and that's the, the route I've chosen. Yeah, you flip a three sided coin. Now, did you have it's to um, did you have to like, like declare chemistry or could you like go and well, yeah, I guess, like you mentioned, I guess you had to declare one, right? Yes, you declare yeah. one and then you. And then this university entrance exam, it depends on which uh, uni- which field you want to study, right? So mm. I, my entrance exam was entirely chemistry. Uh, and so then if I wanted to do out of one of these other things, I would have had to take another separate entrance exam. Um, and so, yeah. Now, so when you were taking like those undergraduate uh, courses at, at Belgrade, um, you know, how do you feel it's changed over time since you were being taught chemistry versus because now you teach, you know, organic so how do you feel like some of the, what are some of the differences there you think? Uh, well, in, in Belgrade or how has chemistry changed or? In, in, I think, I guess, let me rephrase my question. Like how you, how you teach organic chemistry to undergrads. So when you were taking it as an undergrad at Belgrade, you know, how is, how much has really changed since then, since now you're teaching it? Well, I, uh, I have to say not, not much. Yeah. Um, because you know, I teach organic chemistry one, so this is you know not not, yeah, the it's not rocket science. Yeah, organic yeah. chemistry. There's a lot of lot of basic stuff there, but also um, the uh, the mechanism, the sort of the the way of teaching organic chemistry was changing worldwide. Uh, right about the time, uh, well, I think it's has changed in the U.S., but in Serbia, it was changing right about the time when I started studying. Mm. Uh, and so prior, and you can see that in sort of textbooks, right? So. Um, the, uh, the textbook from which I studied at the University of Belgrade uh, was Peter Wolfhardt's Organic Chemistry. And I ended up doing my PhD with him later on. Uh, but this hey. was one of the sort of, uh, of the series of textbooks that, that had this sort of mechanistic understanding of organic chemistry mm. as, uh, as the front, front and center. Right? Um, and I was the second generation of University of Belgrade to use that textbook. And so from that, you know, my... Uh, uh, and of course, you know that textbook has went through a couple of additional editions, but sure, things don't change too much. And so I think my uh, my the way I studied that subject was pretty similar to my U.S. peers back then, and it is quite similar now. But you know, let's say in the eighties um, and and before, I think a lot of studying of of organic chemistry was very much reaction oriented. Of course, mm. we still study a lot of reactants reactions, but sort of the underlying mechanistic um, things were sort of a side note. Oftentimes they were not, not known still. Right. But it was sort of classes of organic compounds, characteristic reactions, very synthetically and analytically focused, but but not so much mechanistically. Mm-hmm. Now, so you're studying at the University of Belgrade and then, then you decided, um, you know, you're going to do your PhD at UC Berkeley. Uh, so... What were some of the decisions that were like, you know, I were like, because I, I mean, I can only imagine like switching countries, moving, uh, you know, across the world essentially, right? So, what were some of those? Uh, what were some of those thoughts and decisions kind of leading up to that? Well, first one was that I, um, 
I sort of wanted to leave Serbia uh, because, you know, the, the 90s was sort of very, very difficult time there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the, not terribly pleasant. And then the sort of prospect of finding a job and, you know, just kind of working and, and you know, buying a house, something was pretty distant back then. Now this thing has changed a lot. Um, but that was sort of one big big driver. Um, the second one was uh, was my parents were sort of encouraging me to do that, mm. uh, to study abroad, uh, because uh, uh, because they lived abroad and they were sort of supportive of that. Um, and then the third one was that you know I wanted to, um, even though in retrospect it's kind of difficult to explain why the U.S. and not other places in the world. Back then, I was very set on studying in uh, in the U.S. Mm. right, uh, and so uh, or sort of North America. So I applied to only a handful of places: Berkeley, Stanford, and for some reason, University of Ottawa in Canada. Uh, oh. And uh, and um, uh, really, the Ottawa and Berkeley were the only ones to to give me offers. Nice. Uh, uh, and uh, and so at that point, there was not much of a Contest, and so then I went to Berkeley. Uh, but you know, it was um, there was sort of a background story to that. That um, during my second year as an organic student, hmm. um, you know, I was studying from this translation of Peter Walker's book, and then I uh, uh, something wasn't clear to me, and so then I emailed him. Right? So this is you know, like sounds pretty pretty normal today, but it's like 1997, right? So it's certainly <laughs> like. The email just came like three years ago before that. And so uh, and uh, so he gets this email from his kid in Serbia and uh, relatively poor English. And then, uh, and then he responds. And I'm like, oh, like this, is, this is where you should refer to. Um, and so then, you know, two years after that, this was I was doing it as a sophomore in organic chemistry. And then, then um, two years after that, I was like, oh, you know, I'm finishing college. I want to do grad school in the United States. Uh, so I sent him another email. I was like, oh, yeah, you should, you should apply. Uh, and um, uh, and so I did, and then he sort of pushed pushed my application uh, or whatever. So I talked to yeah. somebody who needed to hear about this, uh, and um, and eventually I got admitted, and then I went back there, uh, went went to to Berkeley, uh, and this was uh, this was just, this was a great time, one of the best times of my life. Look at that! I mean. I tell I tell people all the time like sometimes all you gotta do is ask or just send an email or something like that and you never know what might transpire you know. That's yeah, really I mean interesting, exactly. Though. So there's like this formal process, and then uh, a lot of these formal processes are very they're there, there for a reason and they they work. Uh, but sometimes mm -hmm. you know uh, just a, a good word to somebody uh, works. Uh, you know, it speeds up the formal process. And so I yeah. think. Uh, that's that's very important, uh, and you know, like countries like Serbia, which are are notorious for that. That you know, sort of connections are very important to the point that really nothing else is important. That is like a lot of people that are completely incompetent get hired because they have you know a dad who knows uh, who knows people, um, mm. and that of course is not not the way to go. Um, but then uh, the the U.S. is really far far from that. Uh, but it's still, you know, connections still matter, right? And so that's, you know, your, right. the, uh, so that's sort of perhaps an advice to your listeners if, if they need one from me, <laughs> that, you know, building these connections uh, is, is important uh, in addition to just building a resume and building uh, building a knowledge base. Sure. So you you move, you, you get out of Serbia, you land in UC Berkeley, you work for Peter Vollard. Um what are you working on as a PhD student? Like, what do you, what do you, uh, what, well, well, actually I'd like to hear your first, like you land in California. Cause I, I can only imagine like landing in California. Like, you're like, you're probably like, Oh my God. Cause Berkeley's in LA, right? Is that in LA? Berkeley is in the San Francisco Bay area. So it's oh, San Francisco. California, okay. Right? So you learned San Francisco and I can only imagine like what the scenes are like, you know, probably crazy. But yeah, so I mean, like as soon as I land, so I, you know, I I went there in December, right? And so you know, in Europe, it's just like snowing, it's right. pretty great, cold. Uh, and then I um, I land there, and it's it's not very warm, but it's like sunny, and it's just like all the stereotypes of California playing out. So I get to Berkeley campus, <laughs> and like most Jewish campuses, it's U.S. campuses, you know, it's pretty nicely, it's well kept campus, but it also there's like these agaves and these trees that I've never seen before. Um, 
and I was very relaxed. Uh, and then, you know, one thing that I remember is that I, um, when I first walked into what was to be my future lab where I spent the next four years, mm -hmm. this this place looked, you know, like in pretty poor shape. It was, like, <laughs> it was an old lab. Um, it was, you know, all the equipment that was was, was top notch. You know, we could order any chemical, but it's like this was my first impression. The lab just didn't look like this sort of spaceship labs that I imagined should be right. there in California. But then, you know, after a while, I realized, and then eventually it got renovated. But you know, I realized that this is not the the main uh, the main um, asset there. That you know, of course, lab lab space is important, but um, but it was sort of the access to to equipment, the access to really right. you know, funding, and and most importantly, access to, to people. Right. That we have sort of world expert experts within ten minute walk, um, and uh, and that there was sort of really no no limitations to that. Um, and that sort of is something that my peer advisor told me that like you know a lot, a lot of stuff at Berkeley and places like that, but many of them not by sort of somebody directly telling you them. But instead, by the, what we call what he called osmosis, it's just kind of like absorb all this knowledge. Um, and this was just very true because you know there was, there was just like so many interesting things, chemistry and otherwise. There were like dozens of seminars every week that that I wanted to attend because they were all like world leaders in their respective fields. Many of them were not in chemistry, so I had to sort of actively restrain myself. <laughs> but this, you know, I could just like do this all the time. You're going to attend these like amazing seminars in all sorts of areas, and then of course, not do anything on your own. Yeah. Um, but it was just, uh, it was just like uh, an embarrassment of riches uh, in terms of this intellectual stimulation. I could definitely attest to that a little bit because coming to Houston, I didn't know we had you know basically seminars every week, and like you know, I do. I mean, if I really wanted to, you know, we have some. We can go to seminars in other departments too. It's not like limited to organic. And so I didn't even know we had that. So it's been really cool to see um, that. So what did you work on um, as a graduate student? Right. So I worked on, um, it was sort of a very synthetic project. Uh, it was mm. sort of organic, organic metallic chemistry. But I worked on the synthesis of, uh, of organic molecules known as phenylenes, mm. um, which are a fused uh, benzene and cyclobutadiene rings. And so they are... Okay. Mm. Uh, and so the benzene is aromatic and cyclobutadienes are anti-aromatic uh, and sort of putting them together kind of starts uh, stabilizing cyclobutadiene, but also destabilizing the benzene. And so you start seeing all sorts of interesting, both the theoretically interesting phenomena on both localization or aromaticity um, and, and it's just synthetically very challenging. Um, and so... Um, Should we explain real so, quick, you know, aromaticity versus anti-aromaticity real quick? We should. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so aromaticity is sort of this, I think, still poorly understood. Also, my colleagues would disagree with that. Poorly understood the proper property of, of molecules which have a cyclic array of of pi electrons that are um, that are have certain magic numbers that then appear to yield unusual stabilization mm. uh, and the bond local bond delocalization as well as magnetic properties. To these rings, right? Yeah. Uh, and so um, there is uh, this, the, this, the prototypical aromatic molecule is benzene, which has six rings in this uh, in this circuit. Now, all other aromatic molecules are less aromatic than benzene, um, but they show uh, you know evidence of of some of these behaviors at other numbers of electrons, such as ten electrons, fourteen, and so on. Um, and depending on their geometry, whether they're twisted or not, there can be uh, additional numbers. Hmm. Um, and then anti-aromatic molecules, of course, have the wrong numbers of electrons, it's... typically differing by two from the correct ones. Um, and they show um, they don't show this uh, stabilization. In fact, they destabilize. Their bonds are intentionally elongated, and the magnetic properties are different. And so the reason why I say that this is poorly understood is that Sort of the probes for aromaticity are are multiple. So one is reactivity, the other one is structure, the third is magnetic properties, and very often they disagree. So what, what based on one property, people will suggest that something is aromatic, and based on another, they, they will suggest it's not. Um, but um, I think aromaticity definitely exists. It affects a great many areas of chemistry, and 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 uh, our colleague Judy Wu is really sort of exploring how aromaticity of the excited states of molecules 
is affecting properties that we before did not associate with urbanism. But at the same time, sort of, it's kind of difficult to put your finger on what, on, on a one sentence, easily understood definition of urbanism. Yeah, that's a, that was actually a really good uh, um, capture of aromatics because, yeah, you, at least in undergrad chemistry, you know, you learn as aromaticity being this like it is or it isn't it's anti it's non or it, it is aromatic it's but i feel like it's more of a like almost like a gradient it's not like some things just aren't are and aren't and they do behave in 2d and 3d so it, they're very interesting molecules in general so yeah thank you for sharing that i just <laughs> wanted to put that out there um so you're looking at benzene or aromatics and um you're reacting aromatic molecules with anti-aromatic molecules right Exactly. We're trying to put them together in one bigger molecule. Um, mm. And that uh, uh, is sort of, uh, there, there's several reasons to do that. One is that because aromatics is poorly understood, this was supposedly going to help us. Um, then uh, there, these molecules are very rich in carbon. So they, when you sort of, you know, put them in a furnace and, and eliminate the remaining hydrogen from them, then they can produce all sorts of unusual carbon structures or carbon mm. nanostructures that are not nanotubes, they're not fullerenes, they're not graphene, they're something else. Um, then, of course, it's synthetically quite challenging. Um, and because the key reaction that we were using uh, was this uh, cobalt-mediated cyclotrimerization of alkynes, mm. there was also a lot of organometallic chemistry as well in there. And so there was sort of a bunch of things that came together. Um, and so I worked on that uh, for, uh, for four years. I made a bunch of these phenylines. I made a lot of um, other macrocyclic compounds of very large organic rings, and these are mm -hmm. something that uh, uh, that I still do now in my, my independent career. And then in two thousand five, we uh, I, I finished. I graduated. Uh, and uh, were there any uh, key findings? You think anything the that really kind of stands findings, out? Um, this was sort of, um, there were a couple of moments during my PhD where it was just sort of like, oh, this is, this is pretty awesome. Mm. Um, but I think one was, but I think uh, most of it was, was relatively steady progress. It was kind of pretty evol evolutionary in terms sure. of, of increase. Um, but one of them was, uh, one of these findings was the, 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 our, that we discovered that we can use alkyne metathesis, which is another organometallic reaction to construct uh, these materials much faster than we, we did before. Mm. Um, and so this is, um, we did it in 2003 and nowadays it's pretty well established. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, making some of these, you know, targets sort of this final time when you, when you produce it and you get the clean NMR spectrum and you know that you got it, that's a pretty, pretty special feeling. Um, also almost, you know, at times a little bit paralyzing because, you know, once you're successful, then for a couple of days, I don't really know what to do with myself <laughs> because it's just kind of like everything else <laughs> stepped down. Right. Um, it wouldn't last too long, but it was just kind of an interesting feeling. I was like, ah, oh, what success locks <laughs> you. <laughs> That's really cool. So uh, what were like, so what, then, then you go do a postdoc um, at uh, UCLA. So what mm -hmm. were, um, some of the decisions like going into doing your uh, postdoc. Yeah, that's uh, that's sort of an interesting time, and that's uh, something that my PhD advisor was very helpful. And so he mm. sort of suggested that, of course, I should work on something that uh, uh, that I enjoy, uh, that I want to to learn more about. He also suggested that I should um, diversify so that I work on something that is uh, quite a bit different from what I did as my PhD. Uh, as well as that I should do this in a place like geographic location, which is, which is appealing, right? And so this was, he was, he was a big arguer, a proponent of not doing a postdoc in, in College Station. And this is here where I <laughs> work. The shade uh, of A&M. <laughs> right. And so that's, um, um, and so I, uh, I applied for, play, uh, you know, I, you know, cast a pretty broad net. I sent out four applications for uh, for my postdocs. Um, one was um, MIT. I applied for uh, to work with Tim Swagger, who promptly responded that uh, that he was out of space, but you know, thanked me for my application. Um, and then there was uh, ETH in Zurich, 
uh, where I applied to work with the with the late Francois Didri, mm. um, uh, and then uh, University of Tokyo, where I applied to work with the uh, Eiji Nakamura, and both of them accepted me. Um, but then, kind of late in this game, I um, I uh, sort of stumbled across uh, Fraser Stoddard's work mm. with UCLA at the time, um, and then. Um, this was also a decision which was personal uh, uh, at the time because my my then girlfriend, later wife, the later ex wife, um, she was still a student at Berkeley, and so uh, sort of staying geographically close would have made this work better. Um, and then um, I, out of all these you know three opportunities, I chose the Fraser, and so I moved south to UCLA. Uh, and that was uh, that was uh, in retrospect a great decision. It was yeah. Um, it was uh, one of the nicest periods in my life. You know, I was I was twenty seven, twenty eight, uh, and um, the chemistry at UCLA. First, the group was much larger. It was much better funded. Uh, it was uh, it a very global. Uh, uh, you know, Fraser would you know, jet around the world throughout mm-hmm. most of most of the year. Uh, and it was uh, it was a lot of postdocs, and so it was kind of a good place to be a postdoc yourself because there were a lot of other people with similar plans that you could share your ideas with, your your concerns, what have you. Um, and the the most important part is that the chemistry worked there really well. So at at Berkeley, you know, I and I did quite well, but uh, but the reactions, just the, the experiments, were just quite difficult and often unsuccessful. And uh, at UCLA. Almost everything I tried worked quite nicely, and uh, and so that you know that that papers and um, uh, and a uh, uh, bunch of conferences, uh, and it was just kind of a place that uh, that I very much enjoyed. Uh, yeah. at the time, for a while, I uh, I got an opportunity to teach for one quarter. They are a quarter system at UCLA, so I hey. taught organic chemistry two actually there. Uh, to whatever 200 undergrads. So this was an amazing preparation for uh, for an academic career. Uh, and it was just sort of I got to explore a lot of things. And this is something my PhD advisor told me that the postdoc is just a great time in your life to explore a lot of things because you already have a degree. So nobody's gonna you know no matter how successful or unsuccessful your postdoc is, you still have a PhD, so you'll you'll be fine. Um, and um, uh, and so that was really that. Uh, and of course, living in LA uh, was was pretty pretty impressive. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. Not many cities get better than uh, LA as far. Well, nowadays it's definitely an interesting conversation, but I'm sure I'm sure you know years ago it was actually like the the place to be in. Um, and in some cases, it definitely still is. What I want to ask you about though is the purpose of getting a postdoc, because my impressions of it now, I, I haven't really like looked at like postdocs at all and haven't even really considered doing one but my impression of it is getting postdocs at least in a phd for chemistry is like you're either gonna go do you want to be a professor or you want to get like the high-end jobs at like a pharmaceutical or um petroleum company so you know the dows the gsks like they're the ones that are like looking at you is there do you think there's truth to that and like has it really changed at all since you attempted to go get a postdoc like um, no, I think there's, uh, no, yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, uh, and I would just add maybe a couple other reasons. So, so yes, basically, if you want to be a professor, you, it is almost impossible to get a job without a postdoc. There's mm-hmm. a handful of examples I know, but they're probably less than 1%. Uh, and, uh, especially if you want to work at the research active university, uh, then, uh, then you can, um, uh, then you probably you, you do need a postdoc. Mm. Uh, then uh, some uh, some high profile positions in uh, in in industry will will uh, want you to to do postdoc, um, and uh, but not all. I think uh, that depends then a lot on the job market uh, because if the job market is uh, is is happening, uh, then uh, then there's a lot of positions and people can generate good jobs if they're good out of their PhDs right away. Uh, and then, uh, and then when this sort of slows down, um, well, first a lot more people will go to to seek postdocs when the job market is poor because postdoc market is kind of stable since uh, since it's not really funded by the economy. It's, most of them are funded by the government, right? Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so some people will just go to the postdoc positions to wait out the market for a year or two, mm. and it will typically change. And then you apply, and you know, of course you have additional experience, but you know just you were just not unemployed during those two years. Yeah, um, that's a good point. And, I never thought about that. And then of course uh, uh, you you improve your uh, your credentials by doing postdoc. Uh, but then um, there's there's other reasons, like for example uh a lot i was very lucky but a lot of foreign students you know get to the us and you know the top us schools have really they're spoiled for choice so they have first the best american students to pick for and then you know the best students from the top university in the world and then everybody else so they they get way more applicants so let's say you're you're an excellent student uh uh and you get into a place like uh um but you know your age opens some doors but not all uh, and so doing a postdoc at a place that is significantly better ranked uh, will then start opening a lot of doors. Uh, yeah. And so so this is this is a, an important motivation to do that. Um, because to be truly be told, especially the academic market in the US is still kind of discriminatory in that you need to have either a PhD or a postdoc or both from one of the top 10 schools uh, yeah. if you want to work at a research intensive university in the US. Um, and so that that then necessitates not just the postdoc, but a kind of right kind of postdoc. But to be, to be told, you know, all of these reasons are kind of not terribly exciting. It's like, oh, you have to do this. Or yeah. You do this because you can't get a job or just like, I do this. <laughs> but you know, there's like a lot of, actually I think a lot of uh, my peers, you know, I was very good at this. There's like, a lot more positive ways to convince somebody to do a postdoc. And this is like, first, it's um, it's a great time in your life. Uh, and it actually gives you a lot of freedom because when you're a PhD student, you know, you have you have your PhD and there's a lot of formal requirements during that. And of course, when you're faculty or you have any sort of a real job, and there's a lot more other requirements than that. And postdoc is kind of a very free in that um, you have, you know, you have two years or uh, you can live wherever you want. You know it's temporary, so you don't have to sort of establish, you don't have to search for houses or any of that stuff. And um, um, so there's a lot of freedom. If you can get one of these fellowships, then there's even more freedom because you know, not only you can choose where you live and who you work for, you can also choose what you work for. Because if you're mm. if you're a PI and you have a postdoc who is self-funded, you know, provided they don't propose to do something completely ridiculous, you're like, yeah, well, do whatever you like, as long as it's sort of <laughs> kind of aligned with my research interests. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, the 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 stipends are quite a bit uh, more generous than PhD stipends, so this, you're not so poor, so you can afford some, yeah. some things that are nice. Um, so from that perspective, and I, I kind of subscribe to that, because, you know, just like living in LA at uh, that time, uh, doing a postdoc was, was pretty great, so... So, I definitely, uh, uh, I definitely agree. Like, I definitely hear to that because, um, yeah, there definitely is a negative mindset to being like, oh, well, you have to do this to get this job. But that's a good way of putting it because you really could live. I mean, virtually, if you are on a fellowship, you could live wherever you want. But even like, just finding a PI that you're interested in their research and just say, hey, look, do you have opening for a postdoc? I mean, then you could, you know, virtually move wherever you want, really. You know, yeah, and it's a great like stopgap. <laughs> to go literally wherever you want and do, do chemistry. And yeah, like you said, it's not the formalism of a PhD. Like you already have that. So you're more or less just doing chemistry every day, you know? Exactly. And a lot of, you know, us, um, um, has, uh, has of course a lot of funding for postdocs, but not, uh, doesn't have their dedicated funding to, to attract people from abroad or not too much of it, mm. but a lot of European countries or, or places like Japan, um, they have a dedicated funding to attract people from abroad because they have had problems attracting people from abroad uh, in the past. And then, um, and so, so for an American PhD, it's very easy. Well, it's not very easy, but it's quite quite straightforward to get one of these. Um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then you go and live in a foreign country for two years. And then, if you don't like it, you just come back. If you like it, you yeah, sounds back. sounds great to me. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it gives you sort of this sort of government or somebody else sponsors your time of exploration which is which is pretty nice yeah so what did you work on as a postdoc then what, what was the chemistry that you were doing um as a postdoc i worked on uh on mechanically interlocked molecule which is sort of fancy name for molecules that have two components 
that are not covalently connected, but they're inseparable. And so if you have this, it's sort of like a chain links. So these molecules yep. are known as cathinanes or ataxanes. Uh, so I worked with Fraser Stoddard uh, on that. Uh, and uh, my sort of projects were, were still quite synthetic in nature, uh, but mm. we, uh, we, me and, and, and Will, Will Dichtel, who is now a professor at Northwestern, and a couple of other uh, and postdocs, we uh, started using click chemistry to uh, to make the uh, make these mechanical interlock molecules because it's a big buzzword. Sort of, yes, uh, click it's chemistry buzzword now, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, back then in two thousand and six, seven, uh, this was all you know relatively new, and a lot of people are just kind of annoyed, like, "What well, is this click chemistry? It's just a just cycle addition? Uh, What's the big deal?" <laughs> uh, and, uh, and but it was sort of um, the, the objective there to use this very mild conditions to close up these molecules which are very fragile, right? And so right. if you have you know sort of this chain in a link, then of course the links can separate very easily if you look at them wrong. Uh, and so click chemistry <laughs> and, other, and it wasn't unique, but other mild reactions allow you to sort of work on this very fragile complexes and do these reactions. Um, and yeah. so, uh, and then from that, you know, this sort of led to to applications in a whole range of fields in the uh, liver drug delivery devices in liquid crystals. I did work on those, uh, but one one thing that I started towards the end of my postdoc was incorporating this into porous materials, metal organic frameworks. Um, and so at the time, Omar Yagi was at, at UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and. Uh, we collaborated with his group uh, on making these materials. Most of the collaboration actually happened after after I left. Um, but this was really sort of the, the, the first proposals on this were written by by myself and uh, Adrian Cote, who is uh, who was now I, I believe he's still a research scientist at Xerox uh, in Canada. Now, do you know how uh, the the cantonines and rotaxines were used in like? Are used in drug delivery? Do you like have any specific examples or? Uh, well, this is uh, the, the, most of this is, is published, uh, but I think uh, this was mostly the use of rotaxins, where you have sort of this uh, this macrocycle which was threaded on a on a on a string, mm -hmm. and it acts kind of a stop as a stopper for a silica nanoparticle which was underneath, right? Mm -hmm. And then upon some stimulus, this uh, this rotaxin would disassemble, the macrocycle would leave. And the silica would start leaking the drug that was loaded into it. Ah, so it was actually really kind of like uh, you know whatever a cork uh, mm -hmm. on a on a drug delivery bottle that you could remove by stimuli and then also put it back on by a stimuli. So you mentioned you use you you said you uh, use click chemistry, right? Yes. Um, I feel like we should briefly discuss that real quick, as uh, sure. um, well. This is my unpopular opinion, but the Nobel Prize can be a little bit of grandstanding. I'm not saying people that do it are um, like their grandstanding. I'm not saying that. But the chemistry um, is important too. But Click Chemistry just won the 2000 or 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So I think we probably should just, I think we definitely should discuss that a little bit. Um, so if you, if you want to explain uh, Click Chemistry and like what you were using it for. That'd be great. Uh, well, click chemistry is sort of in a in a just a general sense of the word is uh, uh, the method of chemistry that was pioneered by by Barry Sharpless and his co-workers. Mm. Uh, that was uh, sort of chemical reactions that that use uh, that that work almost quantitatively almost all the time, regardless of what else you have stuck on there, um, and um, uh, and that means that so there's. I think he's formalized this in, in, in an article uh, maybe two, two decades ago. Uh, but the idea here is that you have a reaction that just works really well uh, and all the time. Uh, and um, the prototypical one is this copper catalyzed alkyne azide cycle addition, uh, which he did not discover. This was a reaction that was known, that was discovered by Rolf Huesgen, this uh, dipolar cycle addition. Um, mm. But the, the catalyzed version works at room temperature. Uh, with a catalyst which is very inexpensive, it can be copper sulfate and, and ascorbic acid, so vitamin C. So very cheap reagents, mm. um, and this uh, works uh, works almost every time. 
Um, and then there's a number of other reactions, which my impression is that uh, none of them are as popular as this copper catalyzed cycle addition. Yeah. Uh, but um, the idea here, uh, so this this was this reaction was discovered by Sharpless in 2003, I believe. All simultaneously, Morton Meldal in, 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 in Copenhagen now has reported the same reaction, um, although not, uh, he didn't really uh, market it under the term flick reaction. Mm. Uh, and the the facility with the, which this reaction is is operates allowed its use in um, in uh, sort of very uh, very kind of hostile re 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 environments for other reactions, including in the living cell, mm. right? And this is the contribution of the third uh, Nobel laureate, which was Carolyn Bertozzi, and that's the one that I'm right uh, my, my most uh, most familiar with because at the time Bertozzi was a faculty at Berkeley. Um, when, and, and when I was a PhD student there. Um, however, to use this in, uh, in, uh, in living organisms, uh, copper catalyst had to be eliminated because copper is toxic. Mm. Uh, and so what she did then is switch from just regular alkynes to strained alkynes, cyclooctyne. Uh, and uh, this is a work of, of a colleague who was started his PhD a year after me, Nick Agard. Uh, and who discovered that cyclooctane will react with azides uh, even without copper. Uh, and, wow. uh, and that then allowed them to sort of put all sorts of uh, biological probes on either the azide or the alkyne part, click them together and couple them to uh, and, and, uh, and study all this chemistry in itself. And because there's no, the, the nature doesn't use azides and doesn't really use alkynes very much, this was completely, um, you know, orthogonal to the otherwise operation of the cell. So neither did it interfere with the cell too much, nor did the cell interfere with the, with the chemistry too much. Uh, mm. And so that allowed, this is this sort of bi-orthogonal chemistry, um, which this was one of the reactions. And Carolyn actually, because it's covered a number of other reactions, both before and after this, but by connecting to this, I think this is sort of what the Nobel Committee recognized. Yeah, very, uh, yeah, thank you for that aside. That's a, uh... I actually didn't even really read up on the click chemistry. I just hear the buzzword and was like, oh, that's cool. Um, so thank you for explaining that. Uh, so how, so actually I want to ask you like, uh, what were your, some of your, uh, some of your favorite spots in LA and, uh, and UCLA? Like what were some of your favorite things to do down there? Uh, well, you know, in LA, uh, the, the beach was one of them. Mm. Yeah, the beach. Uh, so my favorite beaches in LA would be Manhattan and, Redondo beaches because they were not the tourists would not go to them as much as they would to the Venice and Santa Monica beach. Sure, but they were they were just exactly the same otherwise in every other respect. Um, and then another thing was that just like um, one thing that I, I love to do is just drive around uh, because LA is just geographically very interesting. There are canyons going through the city. There are mountains. It's the beach. Um, there is there's literally oil fields in the city of LA. <laughs> drove from where I lived to the airport, you would drive through the city and there would be this, you know, very small oil field. Yeah. It would be there. Uh, and, um, and and not only that, there's just like sort of, it's, it's, it's a lot more densely populated than Houston. So there's like, you know, sort of neighborhoods that are in all sorts of different ethnicities. Um, so that I enjoyed very much. Um, I still have a very good circle of friends in LA. So that, that mm. I, um, uh, and uh it's uh, Japanese food. That was yeah. uh, the this neighborhood of Torrance, which is south of LA. So it's like some of the most authentic Japanese dishes uh, I, that I've had outside of Japan. And so, I gotta get out there eventually yeah. one of these days. Okay. Seems, it definitely seems like a great place to visit. So how? So how did you? Uh, well, how did you land the job at University of Houston? And what were? Uh, or uh, how did you get to this point? Well, you know, when I was finishing up my postdoc, then I was like, I should get a job. Uh, and then um, academic job market, you you sort of apply for uh, positions by submitting. It's, it's a bit more involved with an industrial job. You submit your, uh, your CV, of course, and your cover letter, but also the description of your past research and the proposals for the future research. Mm. Um, and so based on, uh, and of course, the recommendation letters, follow this from your advisors and mentors. Um, and when this whole package is sent to the uh, 
at, at the time I applied to 50 different universities because it was 2007 when I was applying was a pretty good year. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of opening, openings. Um, and um, uh, I got, you know, 10 interviews out of those 50 uh, applications uh, at uh, places across the, across the country and in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and eventually two of them translated into offers, and so it was an offer between uh, it was between University of Oregon, Eugene, and University of Houston here. Uh, and these were you know in terms of you know their rankings and, and the quality of uh, faculty students that they're they're quite comparable, but of course there's a lot of other differences which I think at the end sort of uh, decided uh, that you know uh, Houston is a large metropolitan city. Mm -hmm. Also very diverse, and then uh, Eugene, Oregon, while while gorgeous, is a pretty pretty small town, uh, yeah. and it's um, and as, especially at the time was not not known for its diversity, um, and so uh, me and then my then wife sort of jointly decided to come to Houston. Um, her interests were in in sort of Latin American politics and social studies, and so I think from that perspective, Houston was also a better choice. Yeah, um, uh, and that's uh, that's 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 what happened. Uh, and so this was in two thousand and eight in in August. They showed up here. Uh, a month later, there was my first hurricane, Ike. Yeah. So sleep in a, in a windowless bathroom. It was, a, tr it was... a true Houston experience, right there. I was, you know, I was uh, quite literally a, a warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh. Uh, great segue into you know what your group does now because uh, those uh, those frameworks are very uh, prevalent nowadays. So if you want to explain your research now and what your group is up um, to nowadays, okay. So my group uh, is uh, I've been very lucky to work with you know uh, let's say my exact number, but let's say on the order of 30, 30 to forty people uh, mm. from all over the world. I think it's we're up to eighteen or nineteen countries now um, on uh, on all sorts of projects that are sort of related to the my training, so the applications of supramolecular chemistry, which I did at UCLA, and synthetic organic chemistry that I did at Berkeley, um, but on application of this to a little bit more of material science. Um, mm. And so we have throughout the past 14 years uh, done all sorts of things, but now we have kind of settled on making um, molecules and materials that are of some interest to the, the capture of greenhouse gases. Uh, and um, the way this, this appears to be working in our hands is that we make small organic molecules that then self-assemble into, into crystals. Uh, and these crystals are different from all other crystals in that they're porous, meaning that they have large voids because they pack inefficiently. Um, and one of our most challenging tasks is how to design this inefficient packing by designing a molecule because predicting a crystal structure from a molecular structure is still kind of a black art. Um, and then once we have these crystals, we want to make uh, enough of them so that we can test them, oftentimes in collaborations as sort of materials for the capture of anesthetics or carbon dioxide or freons or, uh, or you know, what have you, we're working on methane now. Um, and so this is sort of a project that, um, uh, you know, I claim all the credit for, but uh, it was really <sighs> the key discoveries that really set us on this track were made by two of my former students. Uh, this is uh, Tang Hao Chen, who is now a professor in, in Taiwan, and then Qing Ji, who is a professor in China, uh, who have uh, really developed these, you know, these initial molecules uh, with minimal input from me, and oftentimes with kind of subtle encouragement of me, which came in the form this will never work <laughs> okay try it if you want to <laughs> uh, and sure enough these things work uh, get all the honesty so, there yeah so this is so that I, I doomed them to success by saying <laughs> i will never work um and um and and that that is something that that's a model that i kind of like in that uh some of the the, the best ideas that i claim credit for were not my ideas um but um uh, but I think it sort of shows that, that my group is a fertile environment for this thing to happen to, to students. Sure. Uh, so with the uh, the frameworks and I know this to so the app. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to explain to people that like from the chemistry point of view, 
we're not necessarily the ones doing the applications. Like we're just the ones kind of right. making, we're just the ones making these things. We don't necessarily use them for applications, but I assumed, I, I'm just going to assume that you're kind of into the literature a little bit um, on like greenhouse gases. I assume you are a little bit. Um, but so how like, uh, and you can say you're not an expert on this, but how big, a how big of a problem is the greenhouse gases? Um, like, is it like a sizable uh, problem? Because at least from media, some media is saying, you know, it's like, it's going to end the world in 10 years. And then you have other media where it's like, ah, it doesn't even exist. So, you know, what is the, is there, is it somewhere in the middle? Is it something that we should be definitely worried about? But I don't know. I think we should definitely be worried about, but I think it's sort of, um, you know, the, 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 I think that the truth is somewhere in between us as always. Um, uh, the first, you know, the, the climate is changing and, uh, that, uh, that is neither good or a bad thing, uh, depending on how far you zoom out of it. This, uh, you know, from the perspective of our planet, that's really completely neither good or bad. Right? And a lot of people who are saying like, oh, we should save our planet. It's like, we, our planet will be fine. Yeah. As long as we don't actively blow it up into pieces, it will, it will survive. It's just that we might not survive. Right. Uh, because, um, you know, we, you know, like to think a lot about our, uh, uh, you know, uh, about how resilient and big and strong our country. But I think COVID epidemic has shown us, especially the early days of COVID epidemic, where all of these elaborate systems that we're building, they're just all collapsed. Uh, and um, in within a matter of weeks, uh, it just shows that, you know, a human society is still very fragile, right? And so during COVID, we saw that, you know, we had this, all the airplane traffic just stopped uh, and, you know, deliveries, you know, before you could get, uh, you know, a pink pencil on a Sunday afternoon mm. delivered to your house. Now, and then during COVID, you couldn't get, you know, toilet paper delivered yeah. for a week. Um, and so uh, what I think people don't realize, because we live this kind of sheltered life in industrial society, is that, you know, we are still very dependent on nature very directly and, uh, and that we are really comfortable living in a very narrow range of, of atmospheric, you know, coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that like, you know, and, and I think anybody who has not had electricity during the close Houston summer for a day should oh, appreciate man. that nature is, is a powerful <laughs> force and that we just, we just barely, you know, barely resisting it. Um, and so from that perspective, I think uh, then, uh, then these changes, which, you know, on paper look kind of small, you know, like increasing global temperature averages by, you know, two degrees. I'm like, yeah, it's two degrees. How, how important is that? Turns out this is actually very important because, you know, most of our crops grow within a very narrow range of, of, of temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of, you know, our forests, uh, the, the, a lot of climate is, uh, is a lot of, not climate, but a lot of weather events that are damaging are influenced by this. Uh, and so, there, and of course, there's just, straight out heat waves that mm. uh, in developed countries like France and, and the US and, and Japan, you know, kill people by, by thousands um, during the past year. Um, and so I think these sort of, uh, this uh, greenhouse gases are, the emissions are happening. They are responsible for climate change and climate change does affect us. Uh, but uh, I think there's now a growing realization of people kind of reaching consensus that this does, that. I think a number of people that seriously deny climate change has dramatically dropped in the past 10 years. Uh, and I think even those who are denying it in public still privately believe in it. They just <laughs> deny it for whatever reason. Um, but I think it's also the, the number of people who believe that we can prevent climate change has, has dropped dramatically. Um, and that we are sort of now resigned that the climate change is happening and that we're already adapting to it. And that it's just, we got to prevent it from worsening and we got to continue the adaptation stage. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for people, it's sometimes, you know, these things that seem so detached from everyday life. It's kind of like, how do you, how are you adapting to climate? How am I adapting to climate change? And it's like, you know, I have agreed to pay electricity bill, which is, you know, 30% more than it was 10 years ago. Because I use more air conditioning, and you know, I haven't gone on a riot in the streets because of that. Because I adapted to climate change, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, people that rebuild after a hurricane and don't just move away, uh, they're adapting to climate change. So this is happening to everybody. Yeah. Um, but it's just that, you know, at some point, this adaptation, uh, you know, will start affecting so many people that perhaps preventing us getting at that point is mm. worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, you can't like, there's nothing we could do right now that'll like stop climate change. But I think P, if once people individually realize like, you know, there's something that we can do day to day to s- and start changing that, that, uh, that mindset, then yeah, that's all we really, really can do. What I want to ask you too, is kind of the chemistry of gas capture of your molecules, because I actually, I, I didn't realize how much as like a chemist you take for granted. Like when you think about the air, like we know it, it's oxygen, nitrogen, and argon, maybe some other gases. But to us, it's very conceptually simple. But to many people that don't do chemistry, like like the air, it's not invisible. I mean, it is invisible, but there's things in the air. So how do your molecules uh, that you make, the frameworks, how do they capture gas? Like what does that mean, right? Okay, so um, well, first, we don't capture gases from air. So this mm. would typically be, uh, and of course, you know, we're still away from applications quite a bit. So, um, so we're capturing this in lab conditions. Uh, but the idea here would be to capture these gases from point sources, because you know, focusing on things such as carbon dioxide and the concentration of carbon dioxide in air is 0.04%. So it's very small. Mm. And we, we're not going to capture it from air. That's, that's not the plan. The plan is to capture it from a power plant or someplace which emits a lot of carbon dioxide. And in those those emissions, it is 20 or 30 or 40 percent. Um, something similar applies to freons, which are completely synthetic man-made gases that are used for refrigeration. Mm. Um, and they can be also captured at the point of emissions, which would be, you know, let's say a leaking fridge or an air conditioner. Or some of them don't even need to be captured. Uh, some of them are being phased out. And so there is just, uh, you know, tanks and tanks of these gases that you can't just, you know, vent into the atmosphere. They just need to kind of uh, store them indefinitely in some sort of material yeah. that buried in the ground. Um, so it's just sequestration away from that. And so the way this would work is that, you know, we have these materials, which, you know, to anybody else, they look like a white powder, uh, right? Um, but their microscopic structure is different from, let's say, sugar, which is also white powder, in that um, there is pores, kind of like a sponge has pores, except that these pores are very small. They're sort of on the side, on the dimensions are similar to the dimensions of carbon dioxide or some of these molecules. And so as the gas passes through this, um, through this sort of powder, some of it stays in the powder, right? Um, and so you sort of have a basically powder filled with gas. Um, and then that allows us then to, uh, now of course, um, we're not going to keep carbon dioxide, for example, in that powder indefinitely. Mm. We like to capture it from some place which risks emitting into the atmosphere and then put it perhaps underground to some place where it's going to stay for a while because carbon dioxide is heavier than air. So I think if you put it underground, it's going to stay stay put for a while. Mm. So uh, does when you, in the lab setting, when you have, when you pass um, those point gases through the, the, the powder, does it, is there an obvious change? Like, can you tell, like, is there a color change? Is there, I don't know, some, is something like letting you know that something's changed at all? There's or... no visible change, but there is a change in mass, of course, mm. because uh, it takes up this empty space. You know, it's filled with the gas, which of course has weight. Uh, but uh, some materials, although not very few, show some optical changes. But most of the time, this is uh, relatively, uh, it's a difference that has to be detected through some more sophisticated means. And what are those sophisticated means? Because I don't know. <laughs> well, why would we measuring measuring this this balance, uh, measuring the weight? Um, mm. And so this would we'll do something known as thermogrammetric uh, thermogrammetric analysis, uh, where we have a very sensitive balance, and uh, and that balance holds our powder. And then as we pass a gas through that balance, we see the ma- mass of powder increase, and we can quantify by how much it's increasing. And now, what is that? We can... Real quick about that. What's like the apparatus? Is this like like are we talking about like a scale like on the bench top or like is this a certain instrument you got to like put this powder into like a box? You know what I mean? 
Well, in effect, this is, you know, the, the, the heart of this instrument is just a very sensitive balance. Mm. But of course, it is connected to uh, to a gas stream. It's connected to computers, so you can analyze all of this. And it costs, you know, $40,000. So it's it... 10 to 15 times more expensive than an actual balance. Uh, but in fact, it's a balance that you can heat, that you can pass gas through, and that you can very finely monitor these changes in mass that associated with that. That's crazy. Uh, and this is used a lot to see how the materials behave when exposed to gases or when exposed to to increasing temperature to see how the materials decay as they as they're heated. Mm. So this now, is what... a relatively standard method. This you know it's uh it's not not every day, but a lot of people will do this in, in labs. So this is pretty commonly used. Yeah, it just but even for me though, like I like because I don't you know I obviously don't I don't really work with frameworks and like. Um, right. th this this gas capture so to me like what is the what like on average if you're just if i'm just someone in the lab working on this like what what is the what's the mass difference like is there like how much like well that depends on the material but for example we have developed some of the materials that uh, will capture some fluorinated gases mm. to the tune of 220 percent by weight so you have like a gram of your material it will capture almost two and a half grams of a gas. Two and a half grams of gas? Yes. That is crazy. Almost. So yes, it stores, it can store, and, it, and ours are not record folders anyway. So you can you have these materials which will store five, six, or more times by weight of gas than their own weight. That's crazy. That's really cool. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Trying to think, uh, what are the some so like what are some of the other methods then to like how do you like prove like okay we've captured this this gas? Well, sometimes if you're lucky, uh, the gas will be strongly enough captured that we can detect it by crystallography. So mm. we can take the crystal structure, we will see our framework, and then uh, well ordered within the framework, we'll see a molecule of of CO two or or something else. Um, this doesn't happen as often because uh, many times the gas just kind of tumbles around and it's not very ordered. Um, but uh, in cases where it does happen, then you're pretty lucky. So you nice. Well, Professor Milianic, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on today. I uh, really enjoyed it. I uh, really having a good conversation today. And uh, is there anything else that you know? Uh, any advice that you want to give to those? Uh, Anyone, any prospective graduate students um, or just, you know, chemistry students in general? Um, well, to prospective graduate students, I think I would suggest that they, you know, they should um, explore their options and sort of, uh, you know, cast a wide net and see, uh, let's see where it takes them. Mm. Uh, and that they should, again, not uh, underestimate, uh, that they should view this uh, the, the, the PhD, the graduate school has, has kind of a holistic experience and not just the research experience and sort of try to balance their personal lives, their interactions with their colleagues, which many of them will become very good friends, lifelong friends, with also sort of a more rigorous uh, academic uh, importance of what they're doing, uh, future employability and so on. And sort of because these are not, um, the PhD is not only the uh, the most uh, the time when you deal with science most intensively in your life, mm. but it's also that for many people it's just the best years of their life. You know, typically you will, you're in your twenties, you're young, you know, your world you're young, strong, and beautiful, and so <laughs> you should your uh, uh, right. You always your oyster, and you shouldn't really um, uh, you should enjoy this in uh, in as many ways as possible, not just professional. Um, and then for, for the current PhD students, I think uh, looking towards their future, I, I, my advice would also be to sort of explore things uh, as broadly as they can. If they're thinking of a postdoc, go to a postdoc in a different country on, on, uh, on working on a topic you've never, uh, you're interested in, but you've never done with, dealt with, uh, and, um, and something great will come out of that. Mm. Um, but again, sort of this, you know, casting a wide net, uh, not specializing too early. I think that's that's advice that I like to think I, I followed. Uh, and, 
um, and I, I I think I enjoy the outcomes of that. So yeah, suggest it to other people too. Well, thank you for your time and consideration. And uh, well, guys, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.